So, in the second part, we're going to talk about the nth order. Um, linear ODE, how to solve it. So, here's basically the problem. You get something like um, A, A n, y to the n, um, plus a n minus 1, the n minus 1 derivative, plus a, let's say, oh, what's the count here? I guess a1 y prime plus a naught y equals 2. Now, <clears throat> this is an nth order uh, linear, well, it's linear because the dependent variable y and its derivatives, y prime, y prime prime, all the way up to the nth derivative, appear linearly. The coefficients, the coefficients, what are those? Those are a n, you know, all the way down to a1, a0. These are generally functions, um, you know, from the reals to the reals. Sometimes we might consider them to be defined in some subdomain, like some, some smaller subset, right? Um, in fact, most of what I'll do today uh, is going to assume that those are constants. Um, now, <clears throat> g, the so-called forcing term, or inhomogeneous term, is, is, is what I'm calling g. Now, I, you notice I haven't written the um, the independent variable here. Traditionally, the independent variable is either taken to be t or x in most of what I do. Um, so, independent variable is actually not, it's, it's, in, it's ambiguous for my current statement of, let me, let me call this star. So, sometimes I'll say y prime is like dy dx. If I say that, then Aha, uh, then you know the independent variable is x. Or it could be that um, you know, y prime is dy dt. Right? Or I don't know, you could have y prime is dy dt. I mean, you, you, you gotta get choices. I mean, whatever. Okay, so I would like to point out that we can rewrite this differential equation as an operator acting on y. So, what operator is that? So I'll talk to you immediately about the operator's viewpoint. So basically here we're going to have um, d is equal to d dx or, or, you know, or d dt, you know, it's appropriate. Okay? I don't want to commit to x or t. Uh, and so in, in, in that notation, you see what we can say is we can say that um, star is really what? It's really a to the n, a n d to the n, plus da, 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 plus a one d, plus a naught. That whole thing is an operator. All right, acting on y is equal to g. So, what does d to the n mean? I mean. Like, for example, d squared acting on y is what? It's, it's equal to d of dy. Right? So squaring an operator is, is multiple composition of the operator with itself. In this case, it's just higher derivatives, which we're familiar with in calculus 1. And because I have no love of writing a to the n, a n d to the n, plus da 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 da, all this stuff, I like to usually give this thing a name, at least for the discussion we're having right now. So let's do some name calling. What do you want to call it? I mean, I'm going to call it what I usually call it, which is L. A suggestive letter, because this is, in fact, a linear operator, right? L. So with this notation in mind, we have some terminology. And here's our terminology. Um, if you have L of Y equals to zero, this is a 
Yeah, homogeneous equation or homogeneous equation. Is it caramel or is it caramel? Yes. Um, so that would be a homogeneous equation. And likewise, if you have L of, you know, L of Y1, for example, equals to zero, then you say Y1 is a homogeneous solution. And it's a homogeneous solution uh, to L of Y equals to G. Now that's a kind of dangerous game you play there because technically speaking, Y1 is not a solution to L of Y equals to G itself. Yes, Lynn? Wait, I was going to ask, like, since if, like, for the first thing you wrote, L of Y equals zero is like a general thing, but then, like, are you saying Y1 is just a specific variable? Yeah, Y1, Y1 could be like. So that's the solution? I mean, I, I say I, I, Y1 equals like some function, you know, some function, um, some given function. But like L of Y1, like, in that case, L may not necessarily be linear. Uh, like only a I'm only talking about linear equations. Linear, 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 linear. linear. I was talking about linear. Um, it, it, it is, in fact, probably possible to talk about homogeneity for nonlinear problems, but that's not something to do. Okay. Um, okay, so, the, but again, that's kind of a dangerous terminology. Yes, Y1 is a homogeneous solution to L of Y equals to G, even when G is not trivial. Because technically speaking, Y1 is not actually a solution to star, it's a solution to a corresponding homogeneous equation, sometimes called the auxiliary homogeneous equation. So, you know, on the other hand, if you have L of Y equals to G and G is not identically zero, then L of then, you know, this is it's 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 a non-homogeneous equation, okay? All right. So our first order of business today is to study homogeneous equations and learn how to solve them. Once we understand the solution to the homogeneous problem, it's then a simple matter, actually, to go solve the non-homogeneous case. There's a general technique we can use to solve it. Okay, so what's the theory of homogeneous equations? My first observation would be is that if I have L of Y1 equals to zero, and I have L of Y2 equals to zero, and I have all the way on down to L of Yn is equal to zero. So if I have N um, homogeneous solutions, I can then prove if I have L of the sum, I equals one to N of C sub I, Y sub I. Well, L is a linear operator, okay? And so what that means, and I haven't proven that, right? But that follows from the property of differentiation and scalar multiplication, and that's the truth. So if some I can put that in C sub i, L of y sub i, but of course this is identically zero for each one, so you get zero, right? So that shows that y equals to um, c1 y1 plus c2 y2 plus mm -hmm. da, plus c n y n is a solution solves uh, solution to L of y equals to zero, right? That shows that the, a linear combination of solutions is again a solution for a homogeneous problem. <coughs> now, point number two here, and this is something that I'll prove in the notes, but I won't try to prove for you today, is this, is that um, there exists well, let's see here. I'm given um, a nice, a nice enough L. Now, <laughs> that's not a technical term, <laughs> but as an example of a nice enough L, if all the coefficients are constants, it's definitely nice enough. I do need to assume, in fact, oftentimes the leading coefficient is just taken to be one. All right. Anyway, so if the, if, the, if the differential equation is made from coefficients, which are reasonable, um, certainly constants reasonable. Um, tomorrow, perhaps, we'll talk about being reasonable. 
if it's nice enough, then um, there exists an linearly independent homogeneous solutions. So these homogeneous solutions we call y1, y2, da da da, yn. Um, such a set of solutions to y, uh, l of y equals to zero, nth order homogeneous differential equation, such a set of linearly independent solutions is called fundamental solution set. So again, a fundamental solution set is a set of solutions to the homogeneous problem, um, which is also a set of linearly independent solutions. And also, the assumption is we have enough of them. We have n of them. That's, that's the next punchline here. There, so the, the theorem is that there exists n linearly independent homogeneous solutions, and here's the punchline. The thing we just proved was the solution is in fact the general solution. In the sense that if I'm given, right, if I'm given an initial data set, all right, there exists a unique choice of constants C1 through Cn for which that linear combination is the solution. So there's an existence and uniqueness theorem here, much like there was for the first order problem. Yes? There's like a basis and like vector space coming here somewhere since you have like linear. Oh yeah. yes, in fact yes. What I'm saying from a vector space perspective here is that the solution space to this differential equation is an n-dimensional vector space. And this fundamental solution set, these, these functions are a basis for that fundamental solution space. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All of this without much to say about L of y equals to g just yet. All right. But you see, now we have a game plan. We know what the road ahead of us now. So just to stay on path here, so we see what we need to do. So here's the, here's the thing. If we want to solve L of y equals to 0, We need what? Find y1, y2, da da da, yn linearly independent um, solutions. If I can do that, the theory tells me game over, I have solved the homogeneous problem. Okay. So, how do you do that? How do you solve the homogeneous problem? All right. Now I'm going to specialize. This, this theory works just as well for constant coefficients as it does for variable coefficients of a reasonable nature. And certainly, if they're all analytic, it works um, in the sense of having a convergent power series expansion, like Cummings too. But now I'm going to focus. I'm going to focus in on the case of constant coefficients. All right. So let's do that. <clears throat> so I'm going to come back over here. Um, and also, for the sake of you know, for the sake of common decency, uh, we force a sub n to be equal to uh, a sub n equal to one. All right. And let's suppose that these are not functions, but now let's assume they're constants. And the n real constants, okay, I'm not a monster. Real monsters, real, real, real constants. Then you see star. What is star? Well, star is exactly um, d to the n, right? Plus a n minus 1, d to the n minus 1, plus da da da, plus a 1 d, plus a naught. All of this acting on y equals to. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the homogeneous case for the moment, guys. Zero. Okay, so let's, let's study the homogeneous case. All right. You notice what this is. Well, this is a, this is a wonderful thing. This, this is a polynomial in the differentiation, differentiation operator, right? We know a little bit about polynomials of linear operators. 
啊，我都没有录。啊，我都没有录的。So one of the, I mean, the, the critical thing here, we can factor it. All right. So let me just make a couple of observations here that are easy to prove. I won't do it, but I'll let you do it. These are simple things to prove. You can prove that, one of the things you can prove is that uh, D plus um, C1, let me not use C1 here, let's say D plus A uh, times D plus B is equal to, well, it's equal to, in fact, D squared plus A plus B times D plus AB. And of course, A and B are real constants, so you can commute those, right? And so consequently, this is also equal to D plus B times D plus A. So, I mean, to make a summary without me getting too involved in this, basically, we can manipulate polynomials in D. just like ordinary polynomials. So what does that mean? Well, this is a real polynomial, right? So the fundamental theorem of algebra applies. There's n factors. Yeah, there's at most n um, distinct solutions. Some of them could be complex. Some of them could be repeated. So basically, we can we can. I was calling this thing. This was L, right? So basically, I'm saying L is equal to something like d minus lambda one to the m one, d minus lambda two to the m two, da da da, d minus lambda r to the m sub r, where lambda one through lambda r are all reals. And m1 through m sub r, these are, these are integers that represent the algebraic multiplicity of these roots in this polynomial. And then, of course, we have other things like d minus alpha 1 squared plus beta 1 squared to the, um, let's say, k1, da -da 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 -da, d minus alpha sub s squared plus beta sub s squared to the ks, right? And so basically here, I'm saying alpha um, alpha 1 plus or minus i beta 1, da, 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 alpha s plus or minus i beta s. These are complex zeros of the polynomial with respective multiplicities k1 through ks. All right, this has to happen by algebra. This is all that's out there. It's a real polynomial. We know its structure. We know it factors this way. We also know it's a royal pain to actually find this factorization for a given non-trivial polynomial, but nonetheless, it can be done. It also can be proven that it can be done in plus form with formulas, right? That's been done for about 200 years. But this much we can say, m1 plus da, 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 plus m sub r plus what? 2k1, uh, plus 2k1, right? Plus da, 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 plus 2ks, what's that equal to? That's equal to n, right? That has to be n. Mm -hmm. All right. My, my fourth observation is really the driving, wonderful, just completely fantastic thing about this problem. It, it, is, it is a simplifying statement. Um, so we, we have this L, we, we factored it into these pieces, right? Right? So <clears throat> let's look at that. So point four, basically we just said that L is equal to L1 
L2, da 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 da, Ln, some of those are repeated, right? And L sub i, L sub j is equal to L sub j, L sub i for all ij. So there, they, this is, we've written L as the, as, as the composite, as the composite of n, possibly repeated, but commuting linear operators. Um, and there's something really cool that happens. If L i of y is equal to zero, <laughs> uh, then L of y is equal to zero. <laughs> Why is that true? The proof is not that common. Yes? This looks kind of similar to like the stuff you did with major C. Like elementary major sheets and stuff? Um, yeah, kind of like that. But, um, I, I, you know, this is a problem I should have put on the final, I guess. It is? Yeah. Oh, well, maybe next year. So here, here is, here is L is this product of operators, right? Which again has this wonderfully rich structure that I don't care about for the purpose of this argument. Exactly. Move this over to here. And then you've got L1, da da da, da Li omitted. All of that operating on L, L sub i acting on y, right? But we're assuming this is zero. And by the way, the composite of linear operators is linear operator. What is linear operator acting on zero? It's zero. Zero again, right? So this is equal to zero. So what this means is that we can divide and conquer. Rather than solving the rather complicated nth order homogeneous problem, we can solve much simpler problems and then put it together. So you can like use each individual factor, I guess? Or? Right, so five to solve L of Y equals zero, we simply need to solve, well, a couple things. d minus lambda to the nth power acting on y equals to zero. And we also need to figure out how to solve d minus alpha squared plus beta squared to the nth power acting on y equals to zero. We need to find solution sets to these more fundamental problems. If we can solve those two problems, then we know that we can take a linear combination of those solutions to get the general solution set. Because if one of those appears in this list of operators, if I solve that, I solve this. So the span of those gives the nth order. Yes. Yes, yes. So that brings us to six. And I will begin with the real case. We are going to use complexification to get the other one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, Start out with this one. We want to solve d minus lambda zero constant acting on y equals to zero. I actually almost did this earlier. Now th this we can solve. This is really separation of variables, right? So this is this is the same as what? This is the same as dy dx. Let's use x for a second here. Um, minus lambda y equals to zero. But I, 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 I solved this with lambda equals to one earlier. Anyway, the general solution to this is, oh, let's not say general, I don't really care about general solution, I just want a solution, right? So certainly you can check y equals e to the lambda x is a solution. Let's call it y1 for the moment, for the sake of terminology. So you can check that directly, right? d minus lambda acting on e to the lambda x by definition is d of e to the lambda x minus lambda e to the lambda x, that's what that means. The lambda there is just a multiplication by that scalar, that's the operation. And so what's chain rule says that this is lambda e to the lambda x, right? And then we cancel and you get zero. Okay, so there's n equals one case. 
How about um, n equals to 2? Um, well, I'm just going to make an inductive assumption. So I'm going to inductively claim that y1 equals e to the lambda x, y2 equals x e to the lambda x, the y um, m equals x to the n minus 1. Oh, that's a bad choice. Let me say k equals k minus 1 e to the lambda x solves d minus lambda to the uh, to the k at the end y equals to 0. So I'm going to, I've, I've proved that k equals one step already, right? So then I need to look at, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm about to show, I need to show that d minus lambda to the k plus 1 acting in y equals to 0 has what? y1 equals e to lambda x by k plus 1 x to the k e to the lambda x as a solution set. Notice, of course, that this is what? This is d minus lambda to the k times d minus lambda acting on y equals to 0. Or perhaps I should write it in the opposite order to make it really obvious. No, I won't. I mean, by, by, the, by number 4, right? By number 4, the fact that d minus lambda to the k takes basically all these guys, right? This one, all the way up to that, which was here, I haven't written it, right? These are all sent to zero by that. That's the inductive hypothesis. So all I need to show them to complete the induction step is that <coughs> what? <coughs> right, we need to show that one. So let's do that. So we have d minus lambda to the k and d minus lambda acting on x to the k e to the lambda x. So we just have to, to do that. So that goes. d minus lambda to k. Let's see here. Differentiating x to the k gives me what? k x to the k minus 1 by the power rule. So I got that e to lambda x in there. And then what? Um, plus lambda x to the k e to the lambda x, right? And then I still have to subtract the lambda times that. So, wonderful. These guys cancel. And you're left with this. Right, which is, which is exactly k um, y sub k, which by induction hypothesis is, it, it, this goes to zero. So this is equal to zero by induction hypothesis, pull out the k, right? By the point that this is k times d minus lambda. k, so the k minus one, e to lambda x, which is equal to zero by hypothesis. So the blue. Which blue? The blue you just wrote. Oh. Well, I will re repeat the claim here and show you. Well, anyway, actually, I'm not. I'm going to resist the urge to show you an example of this just yet. I will show examples soon, but not not yet. So you see, then we have <clears throat> we have just shown that you can uh, construct um, m real solutions for d minus lambda, um, d minus lambda m y equals to zero. Let me, let me just erase this proof and write down what we just, what we just showed. you zoom in on it, Baylor, to try to get as best as you could? That you one? Could. You can at least zoom in over here that way. 
Yeah, just zoom in on that for a second. Okay, I got it. All right. I'm going to come back here and record uh, what we've just learned. So we found, we can prove, by induction, and differentiation, product rule, all that good stuff, that d minus lambda to the mth power y equal to zero has fundamental solution set um, e to the lambda x, x e to the lambda x, x squared e to the lambda x, so forth, all the way on out, x to the n minus 1 e to the lambda o, m, actually here, m minus 1 e to the lambda x. Now there is a gap. I said the fundamental solution set. What am I, what am I obligated to show there technically? Literally independent, right? But, hmm. well, anyway, I haven't discussed what it means for functions to be linearly independent here yet, and I'm just going to leave that gap for now. Why do you show here in terms of the fundamental solution? Because the theorem about the general solution only works for Linear. linearly independent functions. So does the word fundamental have anything? Yeah, fundamental solution set implies linear independence and solution set, and enough of them for the, to get the whole equation. Okay. To give you an example of how this falls down, if it's not fundamental, just a quick example, if I get y prime prime plus y equals to zero, right? And I said, well, my solution set, my solution set is Gemino, how about it's sine x and uh, minus sine x, right? Clearly linearly dependent, then I would claim my general solution is like c1 sine x um, minus C2 sine x. So if my initial data, if my initial data is like y, y of 0 is 1, and uh, y prime of 0 is, is 0, I'm going to have a lot of trouble fitting those initial conditions with that general solution. Because y of 0 is automatically 0 if I only got sine to work with. Of course, if I have cosine, cosine is the solution to this initial data set. So it's important to have linear independence to be sure that I actually have all the functions I need to match possible initial conditions. So even though you have n, it's not necessarily done there. Right, you need linear independence. That's the fundamental solution set. OK, so I've, all of this said, what about, what about complex roots? What about that? Well.
the fact that e to the lambda x solves d minus lambda times y equals to zero, why is that true? Well, it is in fact an elementary exercise. You can show that d dx of e to the lambda x, guess what? Still lambda e to the lambda x. So that real calculation that I went through before this in six, just as well can be done in the complex domain because the fundamental thing it uses is just that the chain rule is lambda e to lambda x and that the product rule holds. Well, the product rule also holds for complex value functions of a real variable. That calculus is true. The derivation holds true. And so my fundamental solution set in the case of a complex lambda is going to be just the same. Well, let me just try to expand on it. So let's just focus on the m equals 1 case, right? So m equals 1, if lambda is complex, I found this complex solution, right? But there's a, a thing you can notice here. If we have, if we have L of, let's say, um, let's call it Z, L of Z equals to 0, right? Then that would be like L of the real part of Z plus I times the imaginary part of Z equals to 0. But L is a linear operator. In fact, the complexification of L, essentially by definition, is when we take the real L and let it act on the real part, plus I times the real L acting on the imaginary part, right? That was what we defined the complexification to be in linear algebra, you may remember. So you see, if I have a complex solution, I get two real solutions, right? So this means that the real part of Z and the imaginary part of Z are both real solutions to L of Y um, equals to zero, right? So getting back to the specific case of L equals to D minus lambda, you see we have two real solutions, right? What are my two real solutions? Exactly. So this is the real part of y is that, and here's the imaginary part of y, right? I use y instead of z in this case. All right, with that, I'm going to erase this and collect our thoughts, OK? Actually, let me do it over here, just in case you get the question. So 7, if uh, lambda equals to alpha plus i beta with multiplicity m, then we have complex solutions. I mean, you don't ever have, you always have, this is, we're starting with a real polynomial, so be careful. Um, I mean, each one of these factors is coming from alpha plus or minus i beta, right? So let's see here. Um, so maybe I should just indicate that. Oh, it's fine. I mean, I could, words. I guess you could say this, or you could say alpha plus or minus i beta with multiplicity m. That would be correct. Anyway, your complex solutions as follows. Your complex solutions, e to the lambda x, x e to the lambda x, da 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 x to the m minus 1 e to the lambda x, right? Complex solutions. Then those, the real and imaginary part of those are actually, these are not, these are complex solutions to what? They're not solutions to the differential equation that we're starting with. These are solutions to a corresponding complexified differential equation. Right, so they're, the, the one we start with is the real differential equation. But we then we complexify it with each of the new lambdas are the solution to the complexified version. Right. But the thing is, the and so I mean, and it's really just a question of context. When I say complexified, I mean that, like I told you guys, linear. Basically, that just means that we allow the variable to be complex. I mean, the differential equation itself 
its definition, its coefficients are the same. They're all real. We're just allowing the solution to be complex. So it's, it's not that complicated what I'm talking about, really. But anyway, because of this little derivation right here, and this holds just as well as, I mean, the z is arbitrary, right? So z could be this or that, any of these guys in this list. And if you look at the thing we did for m equals 1, you see what's going to happen if you have, if you have, what happens here if you have x, if you multiply by an x to the j out front. Daily, you getting this? I mean, this calculation, you can easily multiply by x to the j and see that it just multiplies x to the j on the different terms. So in total, in summary, so hence, um, you know, this is m complex solutions, hence two of them real solutions. So we get x um, e to the alpha x cosine beta x, x e to the alpha x sine beta x. Oh, I didn't even have to start with an idiot. Right? The next thing has the x. So I can compare this 
to like d minus alpha quantity squared plus theta squared, right? And by identification, I can see alpha is equal to zero and beta is equal to one. Or minus one if you like, but let's just use one. So therefore, y is equal to e to the zero x cosine of one times x, right? And my y2, e to the zero times x, sine of one times x, you know, using the, but of course, this is what, this is y1 is cosine x, and y2 is sine x, right? As I just pulled from the thin air at the start of earlier today. That's why. Those are the fundamental solutions. Put them together, you get the general solution, right? Voila. Now, I will admit, there's another thing we like to do here, which is sometimes we like to be able to say, um, we like to introduce a characteristic variable. So sometimes we'll, 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 the corresponding char characteristic equation is this, it's um, lambda squared plus one equals to zero. Here, now lambda being a real or a complex variable. So if I write that, then I have, of course, lambda is equal to plus or minus, plus or minus i, right? And I can say that. What irks me to no end is when I see students write d is equal to plus or minus i. D cannot be plus or minus i. D is a differentiation operator. Lambda, fine. This is a variable, a real variable or a complex variable. I can say that's equal to plus or minus i, but those are the zeros, right? There's an interplay, of course, between the factoring of the operator and the values of the characteristic equation, the zeros that it takes. That, that is true, but they are different. OK. But that's another way to look at this. And this is the way I will sell it to calculus, too. In calculus two, if I teach differential equations, I'll say like, well, write down the characteristic equation, solve it. Once you find plus or minus i, that means your characteristic, you get sines and cosines. So then, I mean, this is the extent of what I write in calculus two when I solve these. And calculus two students can understand this pretty easily. I'll show you how to, I'll call this example. How about this y prime prime plus three y prime plus two y equals zero? What is it? Green again. Well, I use some green. You can like zoom in on it. It'll pick it up. I do on occasion use green. I've watched the videos. It will show up green if you like. I will try not to use green. Not green, green, but they're colored. So fine. This is d squared plus three d three plus two, factoring on y equals to zero, we can factor the operators, d plus one times d plus two. This gives me e to the minus x, this gives me e to the minus two x in its kernel. So I get y equals to c1 plus c2, e to the minus two x there, solve. Yeah. It is weird that second order ordinary differential equations are easier to do than so many of the integrals that you saw in calculus two. Isn't it weird? A little bit of uh -huh. I know, right? But it's just it's a quadratic equation, really. Now, this is not how I sell it to top two students. Like typically, I would say, okay, so lambda squared plus three lambda plus two equals to zero. That's my characteristic equation. So that's lambda plus one times lambda plus two equals to zero, so I get lambda one equals to minus one, and I get lambda two is equal to minus two. So therefore, y is c1 e to the minus x plus c2 e to the minus two x, you know? There's what the solution looks like in terms of the characteristic equation. These are the, you know, the other way of denoting our work. Let us do another.
see, when I, when I first taught calculus two at NC State, we covered second order differential equations in calculus two. That's the usual thing there. Engineering wants us to do that, so we do it. And it's not a bad thing, actually. It's very natural. This stuff is it's good. It's a good to it's good topics to cover in calculus two because it really um, helps students to get better at quadratic equations. And, and Lord knows they need to. Um, I mean, I, I was one of those students once. I didn't really learn. Um, I didn't really learn quadratic equations until I got to honestly until differential equations is where I really finally understood completely the square and just the whole inner workings of it. Because I was pretty good, I could just use the quadratic formula before then. Why would I understand completing the square if I could use the quadratic formula? Right, uh, that's, that's bad. <laughs> bad student. So this one, um, this is what? D to the fourth minus one. Uh, and they may, they may put a number in here to make it more exciting. I want the fourth power of some number to not make it too exciting. What, 16? Oh, so you put 16. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> d to the fourth. So this is d to the fourth minus 16. And um, acting at y equals to 0. All right? So OK, so we do. Now we can factor this, right? This is d squared minus 4 times d squared plus 4. Of course, I can factor the other one further. This is d minus 2 times d plus 2 times d squared plus 4. All that data y equals to 0. At this point, I can write down the solution. The solution is y equals to, general solution of course, c1 e to the 2x plus c2 e to the minus 2x plus c3, a uh, bit of a cosine of 2x plus c4 sine 2x. Hey, we just solved the fourth order differential equation. That wasn't too bad, was it? Now, I would point something out to you here. It is, no, it is, it is a beautiful and wonderful thing, but there's a, there's a wonderful symmetry here, in fact. This can be recast as b1 cosh 2x plus b2 cinch 2x, thus revealing the, the wonderful interplay between cosh cinch and cosine and sine. In fact, that's an alternative way to write this because cosh and cinch are simply linear combinations of e to the 2x and e to the minus 2x. So that's another way you could write the solution here. But of course, it's really just there. Where do you get a cosh from? I don't remember all of that. Well, cosh is uh, one half e to the 2x okay. plus e to the minus 2x. And this guy is 1 half e to the 2x minus e to the minus 2x. So if you if you look at the, if you multiply these out, you can see that like b1 over 2 plus b2 over 2 has to be equal to c1. And um, b1 over 2 minus b2 over 2 would have to be equal to c2. That's the relation between the coefficients for the exponentials and the coefficients for the cosh and cinch. Cosh and cinch are much more useful when we set the boundary value problems at the end of the course. They, they're very, very nice for certain boundary value problems. It's important to know about the cosh and cinch solutions. While I'm on the topic, let's go back to this last example. Something you could have done if you were so inclined. This is d minus 3 over 2 quantity squared. Uh, plus 9 fourths, uh, uh, minus 9 fourths. So plus 2 minus 9 fourths. It's minus 1 fourth, okay, so minus 1 half squared. It is in fact true that you could use y1 equals e to the 3 over 2x cosh of x over 2. So I could like break my general solution to something like b1 plus b2 e to the 3 over 2x cinch of x over 2. If you're so inclined, you could do that. 
you can just say, I don't, I don't accept the use of negative exponentials. I insist on writing everything with caution cinch because I always want to look at things in terms of completing the square. I, I mean, you can do that. <laughs> of course, if you had three factors, there would be ambiguity here. I mean, I could, I'd have one left over. I can't avoid that, I guess. <laughs> and you could, if you had four, you could take the real factors and you could group them differently so you'd get totally different. What's tr it's really quite awful. How safe is this? I mean, think it Indeed. Thank you. Okay. Do you guys understand? Do you need to work more examples of these? I should probably work one with like a repeated sine or cosine. Let me do that. And sometimes it's helpful just to work a really simple example. For example, what if we had one of the ones I worked out by double integration earlier? This sometimes the simplest example is the ones that are catch, catch up. If you, if you haven't thought the right box before. So, um, for example, mm -hmm. my prime prime equals to zero. How's that go? So you see here I have I have the I have lambda equals to plus or minus i twice, right? I have a I have the imaginary root plus or minus i mm -hmm. repeated twice. And so then my general solution looks like c1 cosine x plus c2 sine x plus c3 x cosine x plus c4 x sine x. There you go. All right, at this point, I think I've shown you enough of this. We can go on. All right, let me, let me check the time here. 12.41. Believe it or not, there's actually enough time for me to do justice to the non homogeneous part. It's about 20 minutes, I yeah.
Okay, so we, we now have the, the homogeneous solution to the constant coefficient problem. We know that so we can solve any problem. Modulus the difficulty of factoring the polynomial, right? And so that brings us to the next question. How to solve L of Y equals the G. I'm actually not going to do all of it today. I'm just going to do what's called the method of annihilators today. There are two main methods here. So first of all, what's the general theory? Here's the theory. Let me just, let me just take the theory on here for a second. Um, the general solution is y equals u c1 y1 plus da, 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 plus c n y n plus y p, where L of y sub i equals to zero for all i one two da, 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 n and L of y p is equal to g. So this p is the particular solution, and our goal now. Right, because we already know how to find the homogeneous solutions, at least in the constant coefficient case. So we're going to stick with the constant coefficient, constant coefficient case here. Still, we're still assuming that L is, is equal to some polynomial in the differentiation operator, right? <clears throat> okay, so so what? Well, once we find it, then we just add that to the homogeneous solution. That's that's it. So here, let me just start with an example before I get into the theory too much. So suppose you wanted to solve y prime prime plus y equals to t. All right. So I know my solution is going to look like y is equal to c1 cosine x cosine t plus c2 sine t because you know what? We've already solved that problem like twice now. And I know that that's the homogeneous solution to this problem. Now I need to add something here that will give me back a t when I plug it into y prime prime plus y. Just do t. Hmm? You just do t. Just do t. Yeah. For example, t itself. <laughs> Very nice. Because y prime prime is zero and t is equal to t. Very good. Thanks, Daniel. Sometimes you can just guess them. But what if guessing doesn't work? What's the method to find that? Okay. Set it equal to zero. Yeah, I don't know. Well, here's the general approach. So undetermined coefficients. It says you look at just look at g. In this case, and then like here g equals the t. And basically, if you think about that, if you got a t ready to differentiate, you got a one. And that's kind of it. If you look at it in its derivatives, that's all you have. So you, you make this ensemble, this guess, that y sub p is equal to at plus p. That's our, our naive guess. Then you plug it in. yp prime is a. yp prime prime is 0. Put those in. I got yp prime prime plus yp equals to t. And so what's that give me? Give me at plus p equal to t, which tells me my undetermined coefficients should be determined to be 1 and 0, which of course leads me back to Daniel's guess of yp equals to t. So this is the method of undetermined coefficients. Basically, take your forcing term, differentiate it, see what happens, take a linear combination of those things, plug it back in, and see if it works. But sometimes this fails. All right. For example, what's the, what's the downfall of just making this naive guess? To take my example and twist it a little bit, if instead of having t, I have, say, sine of t, right? This naive method, so don't blank, right? So I want to pick sine of t. Well, if I take my sine of t, I either got sine of t, right? If I differentiate it, I've got cosine t. If I differentiate it again, I've got minus sine t. But sine t and minus sine t are the same function of the linear dependence. 
And so this suggests to me that my particular guess should be a sine t plus d cosine t, right? Um, but that seems like a really bad guess because if you plug that back into the differential equation, right, this, this has y of p prime prime plus y of p equals to zero, which of course is not equal to sine d. Most of anyway. So that, that seems like a really bad choice of particular solution. How do you avoid this? How do you modify the value of gas? Yes. What is a? Is that a or a? A? Oh, this? Or y of p prime prime plus y of p. Oh, it's yes. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why we're using okay, hands. I think I was I was writing has, and then I got my mind onto the y part already. So then my s became a y. I think if you want to understand my, my mind, I don't know if that's a work file project, but that's the truth. So how can we make these? Under, so basically, the program of undetermined coefficients is to make a guess for the form of a particular solution that then you can plug into the differential equation and find what the yt is. So our, 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 our goal we have now replaced with, our current goal is how to set up yp equals to a times stuff plus b times other stuff, you know, et cetera. How do I, how do I make up, how do I make the, how do I set it up? Now here, here's, this is the, so what I'm about to share with you is, is the so-called method of annihilators. And here's what the method of annihilators does for us. It, uh, it brings us back to our home. Where's our home? Our home is homogeneous space. We own that already, right? So if you look at this, this is d squared plus 1. Acting on y equals the sine t, right? How can I make this go away? I need what's called an annihilator. I need something that kills sine t. I'm going to use a script anyway. So I, I want the annihilator on sine t to be zero. I already know that, though. Because if you think about this backwards, I already know that d squared plus 1, this one's kind of degenerate because d squared plus 1 is playing different roles. I know that d squared plus 1 times sine t is equal to 0. You see, so what that means is I can make this a. I can make that the annihilator. We also want the minimal. We want the smallest operator that makes it 0. If we if make it too big, it's going to have other stuff. We don't need it. The point is, if I, if I, if I so basically just operate by d squared plus 1 both sides, get what? d squared plus 1 squared, acting on y equals to d squared plus 1 sine t. Now, by, by our very construction, this is 0. And what have we done? Yes. We have taken this non-homogeneous problem and converted it back into homogeneous, at which point we can run down the general solution. And this general solution, we already know, well, this is a general feature of this method. What's going to happen is that this will, in fact, be the general solution to the original um, non-homogeneous problem. I don't, I mean, that's true, but it's not quite done. I mean, like, I have students write this down, put a box around it, and say they're done. That's not accurate. You're not done yet. The original problem is second order. Proper general solution must only have two constants in it, at most. If there's no initial data again. So this would have B linear or B has linear data. This is just it's, it's an incomplete solution. It's a template for a solution. It's not done yet. This you haven't really found the solution. It's the fixed values for C3 and C4 representative of picking out sine t. You see, this would also be the general template for the solution. Let's say if I had added a cosine t, it wouldn't change anything. Except for the values of C3 and C4. So my larger point is this. This is the so-called homogeneous solution. Right? Don't really care about that. 
And I can just look at this and go, aha, well, this is my YP. And I don't know about you, I don't love doing algebra with C3 and C4, so what I usually do is I say I pull out the T and I write A cosine T plus T sine T. And there you go, that's the particular, that, that's the right guess. Okay, and it's in my notes. You can see how it works out. You've got to differentiate twice, it's kind of a pain, blah, blah, blah. But that will work. You can find value for A and for B. I think it's like one half for A and zero for B or something like that. So, <clears throat> let's look at another one. So the method of annihilators says, so here's another one, like y prime prime plus, um, how about y prime prime minus, minus y prime equals to um, t plus e to the, e to the two, all right. So here I have d squared minus d acting on y equals to t plus e to the two. Let me just rewrite this. This is d times what? d minus one, right? How am I going to annihilate t plus e to the two t? What should I use for my annihilator? How do you get rid of t? Divide by t. d squared. d squared. Now the reason you know that is because t appears as the solution to d squared y equals to zero. It's in the fundamental solution set. This reverse thinking I'm doing actually, if you think about it, this method is only going to work if the things that are the forcing term appear in that list of functions we found in our investigation of the constant coefficient case. They have to be exponential, sines, cosines, polynomials or cautious and cinches just in disguise again. Only those things can we use the method of annihilators for in, in its current formulation. If it's not that, I can't find an annihilator and I can't make this work. So if it's not exponential or like, you know, right. sine, sine, and so forth. Yeah, if, if I have like y prime prime, y prime prime equals the tangent, yeah, well, we can't do it this way. We have to do something called various parameters, which I'll talk about when we meet again. But, could you make tangent into like sine no. or sine? Can't do it. So d squared, and how do I get how to kill that? D minus two. D minus two, right? And if you multiply them, again they commute. So this piece kills that, and then this piece kills that, and the structure of the argument. So then I just take this differential equation, and I go d squared, d minus two, and then my original, you know, d d times d minus one. At a y equals to zero, right? But the, the thing is, you gotta pay attention, some of them overlap. And that's why the method of annihilators is so successful, is it picks up on the connection between the forcing term and the homogeneous term in the correct way, and it automatically builds the multiplicities that you need into the into the particular solution, multiplication by t as it happens. So let's see here, I've got y is equal to something like, uh, I'll do the, the, uh, C1 e to the, I don't know, whatever, however you want to write it. I'll do the third one first, fine, fine, fine. So C1 plus C2t plus C3t squared because I've got d cubed, right? Then I've got plus C4 e to the 2t plus C5 e to the t, right? Now you should recognize some of these are the homogeneous solution, right? Which ones are these making the homogeneous solution? I can see homogeneous just from looking at this, right? Sorry, Billy. Mm -hmm. Y H is C1 plus C2 e to the T. So you can see, in fact, this guy and this guy are the homogeneous solution. And I can rip off and I can see, aha, this is going to be what I should guess for YP. So YP is going to be A T plus B T Q B T Q. Come on, really? Really? Not right. Really. Yes, thank you. Squared. Pt squared plus c e to the 2d. Now, I'll, I'll actually work this one out because it's not too hard to work out. So, y2 prime is 1. a 
plus 2 bt plus 2 ce to the 2t, differentiate again, what might be front prime? 2b plus 4 c e to the 2t. Now you're going to plug those in. Plug those in to yp prime prime minus yp prime equals to t plus e to the 2t. What do we get? Parentheses are your friend. things, right? Like, what are my constants? I've got 2b minus a for constant. What are my t terms? Just minus 2b. Minus 2b. And then I've got e to the 2t type terms, right? e to the 2t, I've got 4c minus 2c, right? So 0 plus 1 times t plus 1 times e to the 2t. Of course, constant 1, the linear polynomial with the monomial t, and the exponential e to the 2t, these are linearly independent functions, I can equate coefficients. So equating coefficients gives me 2b minus a equals to 0. It gives me uh, minus 2b is equal to 1. It gives me 2c is equal to 1. So therefore, b is minus 1 half. c is equal to 1 half. And what's a? that all together, what's our solution? Of course, the homogeneous one, C1, plus C2, e to the t. You notice they just relabeled them as a matter of cost of my C1 and C2. It's not written in stone. You could use, Landon would probably use like starfish and something like that. SpongeBob or something, I don't know. And then um, minus A, which was A? Minus t. What was the meaning of b? B was the coefficient of t squared, so minus one half t squared. And c was the coefficient of b two t. So, as you can see, I think we can agree that that's probably not something we could have guessed. Like, yeah, I think some problems are simple enough you can guess the particular solution, but most problems not so much. You do. Yeah, okay. One more example. And then tomorrow we'll do the variation of parameters and the rest of the course. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, if you're free. Um, this is my brother's uh, invention, this problem. I, I like it. It's, it's, a, it's a fun way to look at an old problem. In calculus, too. You find yourself doing things like integral of x squared e to the x of x, right? And yeah, you can do it, right? I mean, you know, integration by parts twice, it's not too bad. But what about Yeah, what about e to the x cosine? really kind of drag. It's, it's even worse if there's an x here, right? Like, that's kind of awful. That may still be awful in what I'm about to do. Maybe I should stick with a simpler example. I'll tell you what, let me, let me take it out for a spin on the easier one, and we'll think about whether or not we want to do that in a second here. So, suppose we want to do integral of x squared e to the x to the x. Let's look at this as a differential equation. We're trying to say this is y, right? And so what you really want is dy dx equals to what? Equals to x squared e to the x. Right? How do you annihilate x squared e to the x? Q. 
cube is the place x squared into the x appears. Okay. If you have d minus 1 squared, d, d minus 1, you get e to the x. d minus 1 squared, your fundamental solution is x, and this is set as e to the x, x e to the x. Okay. d minus 1 cube, you get fundamental solutions at e to the x, x e to the x, x squared, e to the x. Okay. So d minus 1 cubed is by annihilator. And then, of course, I get my e, f a y equals 0. So that says that my solution should be something like y is equal to c1 um, e to the x plus c2 um, x, x e to the x plus c2 x squared e to the x um, plus c3. Uh, oh, I've got two c Of course, you can recognize this is just a homogeneous solution, right? Which would just be y equals 2 c4. So it's kind of funny. And I mean, I think when my brother shows this, he, he doesn't do this. He'll just be like, OK, so if you look at this, really what you should say is, I know my solution is going to look like y is equal to a plus bx plus cx squared times e to the x. As you can see, that's popping out of the annihilator. So if I want to solve that integral, that's, that's got to be the form of the solution. So what do I do? I differentiate it. What's my be prime? Well, it's thing in parentheses differentiated, which is v plus 2cx, and then plus the derivative of e to the x times that again, which means I just add it. and I'm leaving the x out there. And all of that's got to be equal to what? x squared e to the x. And then just group terms. What do we got? I'm using, I'm using green again. <laughs> so for x squared, I got myself nothing, 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 nothing. Oh, see. Equals to 1. Hey, well, that wasn't too bad. Um, how about the x terms? x e to the x, I've got 2c plus b. That's it, equal to 0, which tells me, therefore, b is equal to what? Yeah, b is equal to minus 2. And let's see here, my constants, I've got myself b plus a. Any other constants? No. Equals to zero. So a is equal to two. Consequently, the integral of x squared e to the x dx is equal to two e to the x minus two x e to the x plus x squared e to the x. And given my current technology, plus c four. And there you go. Integrated. No, I don't my parts. This is faster for certain problems. And I would argue much more fun. Now, so for this one, you see what we'd be signing up for would be, we have to say dy dx equals to what? You know, x e to the x cosine x. But you know, jumping past the uninteresting steps, basically we're going to eventually get to the point of y is equal to what? Something like ax plus b e to the x cosine x plus cx plus d e to the x sine x. That would be our guess based on the annihilators. And you just differentiate it and set it equal to x e to the x cosine x. And you can find a, b, c, and d probably faster than integrating by parts in the way. That's even more true once you have coefficients like e to the 2x and cosine of 3x jump like that. I think this sees through the algebra faster. All right, well, that's about all I have to say. So as you can see, method of annihilators, very useful. In the case that our forcing term appears as a product and sum of um, things that appear as the homogeneous solution. So tomorrow we will do, the next time we're going to pick up again, we'll do variation parameters, which um, is general. It will treat any G in terms of a systematic 
uh, and a pro forma law. But most people only teach the n equals 2 case. In my notes, I derive the nth order case using tensor calculus and stuff. This is not really part of this course, but I did it for fun. Here we are so far.